And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira right now, we've read this many times, but it's, you know, rather than jump right into slides or jump right into ideas, I want to jump into God's word. I believe that every word of God is compacted with supernatural power. And... Whether we see the significance or not, or just picking up a verse here or there, have you ever noticed you go to church and the pastor may speak one short verse on a 20-minute, 45-minute message, and that's the only verse he reads, and yet God honors his word? Out of those whole 45 minutes or so that come out of us, what God is really honoring is his word going forth. So we have to always begin, or I always want to begin with a scripture wherever possible, even though we're continuing on a series. And so, un, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira right now, does anybody remember what I said the city used to be called before it was called Thyatira? Semiramis. 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 Now, who knows who Semiramis was? Who can, who can tell me? Who, who was Semiramis? Do you know? She, she's represented as the queen of heaven. She was Nimrod's wife, all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Well, in the book of Revelation, where you see the 17th and the 18th chapter, where does it say Babylon the Great? You have to go all the way back to Genesis, where Nimrod founded the Tower of Babel. His wife is Semiramis, and she's the one responsible for all false religion, the perversion of the zodiac, horoscopes, fortune-telling, tarot cards, witchcraft. And, of course, her. Uh, we, we've already talked about the equivalency when we when we first began in the, in the, the f- part one of this dispensation of Thyra Tyra, we actually looked at Jezebel. Of course, we're not going to cover that again. If you missed that, go back. All this is on YouTube. Go back and listen to that. But it's significant, I think, that the, this city, which is called Thyatira, used to be called Semiramis. Because this is where a woman enters into play. Her name is Jezebel. That's why we went back. We looked at Jezebel. But the Jezebel in this church of Thyatira equates to Babylon the Great in the 17th and 18th chapter. It's a a spirit being behind this. And it equates to the Jezebel in 1 Kings. And it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. So let me continue. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? Remember, all the all the churches have angels, right? All the ch- you know, think about that. All of us have guardian angels individually. All children have guardian angels. When you get older, you didn't lose your guardian angel. And all churches have a guardian angel. In fact, when you go into the Book of Daniel, you find out that the whole nation Israel has a guardian angel Michael you read scripture like in that day Michael shall stand up he's the the guardian angel over the whole nation of Israel so it's very significant don't ever think that you'd lost your guardian angel you not only have one guardian angel you got some other guys just waiting around for you to tell them what to do and if you don't tell them what to do they're just going to sit there and they're not going to do anything so you got you have people working on your behalf. But let's, you know, I'm getting uh, diverted here, and we want to get into the, the juicy stuff that God has us for today. So less of me and more of God, right? That's what we're looking for. So unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. The flame of fire, he pierces into the very heart of the matter, into the very heart of what this, the meaning of this, this church means and this dispensation from 606 to 1520 AD, and also the fact that his feet are like fine brass speaks about judgment. And then I'm just going to read part of this, verse 19. I know thy works. 
dot, dot, dot. And everybody knows what dot, dot, dot. And I cut it off there. And it's okay sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's okay sometimes just to cut it off. Because you know dot, 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 it didn't end. Right? Because I think right now we can focus on the fact that Jesus knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. And he's going to show us something great today. And we began talking about, and I just wanted to to give you this slide to show you where we were. Because we introduced something that was, um, in my opinion, is a phenomenal mystery that most people have no idea. Not only did Thyatira used to be named Semiramis, Rome used to be named Saturnia. After the god Saturn. And we saw that you see you see those four Hebrew letters down here. The first one says it equals 60. The next one equals 400. The next one was 6. And the next one was 200. You add those up, it was 666. The word there is the name for the god Saturn in Hebrew. Saturn was the god of Rome. It was the main god of Rome. And it was called Saturnia. They changed it. This is going this is going to freak you out. If you're normal. <laughs> this is this is a picture of Saturn. Yeah. Is this I mean, can you see, how many horns do you see on his head? Okay, remember we, we said that when we were talking about Rome, we were talking about the beast, and we said we saw this dragon, and we said a dragon was a symbol, the red dragon was a symbol of the Roman Empire. Of course, it's a symbol of Satan also. We talked about Satan having seven heads, right? This Saturn had these seven horns. We know horns represent kings, right, or some sort of entities or powers, Saturn had these seven, and according to mythology, Saturn had seven children, and he swallowed them all because he was afraid someone was going to take over his throne. Mm-hmm. They killed his own kids, basically. And we said uh, that uh, the idea of Satan having seven heads, he actually has consumed all of these beings that worked with him they all work in covenant with him but he only he only he gets the credit have you ever worked for somebody you you work and work and work and they take all the credit i've seen my wife go through that over and over it's such a depressing thing. It's such a challenging thing when someone's taken all of the credit for the hard work that you did. And then you get the blame. So apart from the name Tammuz, uh, Nimrod was worshipped by many other names. And in Rome, Nimrod was worshipped as the sun god Saturn. His birthday was known as Natalis Invicti Salis, which meant the rebirth of the sun. And it was noticed by pagans that the daylight in winter decreases to its lowest point on December 22nd. They assumed that the sun god had died, and they also believed that the sun god had risen from the dead three days later because the daylight begins to increase on the 25th of December. This increase in, in daylight was a cause for much excitement and merriment a day where gifts were exchanged, the commonest among them being the tapers and clay dolls, and these dolls represented sacrifices of human beings to the sun or the sun god. In fact, there have been times where uh, uh, archaeologists have uncovered things and have found the skulls of little babies, thousands of them, and they just cried their eyes out because these little children were were literally offered as sacrifices to these to these statues. The temples of ancient Rome were filled with pagans 
who gave, gave themselves to joy in wild orgies, beginning with a kiss under the mistletoe wreath. It would escalate to men drinking themselves into a drunken state and then engage in homosexual orgies, then go home and beat their wives. Young pigs were offered on the altar and blood puddings were made. Lights were kindled until the 6th of January, and this is the reason behind the 12 Days of Christmas song. Interesting. And homes were decorated with greenery. My point is not to attack Christmas, but just to give you a foundation. This was the worship of Saturn. It was called the Saturnalia. Do you notice the two pictures next to Saturn? The first picture, the one that's sitting down, has a cup in his hand and a cross. That actually was coined by the Roman Empire, representing Rome. Did you know that? I mean, that that was coined, representing Rome, before John talked about Babylon the Great holding up that cup. The other one is the Statue of Liberty. Oh, the other, the other hand. Oh, the other hand has a cross. The cups in one hand, a cross is in another. Yeah, a cross is in another. And that represented Rome sitting as a queen upon the seven hills. This is exactly what John was referring to in the book of Revelation. And you can see that this equated, or there's a connection between Rome here and the goddess sitting there with the cup. She is like the wife of Saturn. And you can see the Statue of Liberty. Now, where does the Statue of Liberty sit? It sits in this country, USA, right? There is a connection between this prophecy, the Book of Revelation, later day prophecy, and the United States of America. And we're not going to get into that tonight, so uh, you'll have to come back. And I can't tell you when we're going to get there, but we'll eventually cover... A connection with the United States. But right now, let's look at this. Uh, we're, we're emphasizing on Saturn here. But pagan traditions are not killed easily. So when the pagan Rome became Papal Rome, the Roman form of sun worship that originated in Babylon became clothed with Christianity. So it's a, it's a uh, historical fact. You can go on the internet, you can do all your own studies. I think if you begin studying this yourself, you'd be amazed at all the things that we just took into Christianity and, and put the, it's like, uh, you know, we just put different clothes on it and called it something else. A simple study of the Catholic Church, for instance, would reveal that in every case the church absorbed the customs, traditions, and paganism of every nation. To bait pagans into Christianity, it was the policy of the church to amalgamate pagan festivals within the church. Fact. Pope Gregory wrote to Augustine, the first missionary of the British Isles in 597 CE. This is a quote from Pope Gregory to, to, to uh, this missionary Augustine. Do not destroy the temples of the English gods. Change them into Christian churches. Do not forbid customs which have been associated with old religions. Consecrate them to Christian use. So, you know, sometimes you think, well, where did all, how did all this stuff originate? Where did it all come from? It all came from right here during this period. All these things were embraced. Why? Because Rome wanted to expand their empire. And we're, we're not talking about the Roman Empire as much as the new Christianized form of the Roman church. They wanted to grow. The name Christmas originated about 450 CE when Pope Julius decreed that all Christians celebrate the unknown birthday of Christ. Notice unknown birthday? We know for a fact that Jesus was not born on December 25th, don't we? Absolutely. It's, it's crazy to think that he was. But uh, it was it, the reason we celebrate it all goes right back to Pope Julius. Because he came up with the idea that all Christians should celebrate this unknown birthday of Christ at the same time pagans were celebrating Natalis Invicti Solis. It was given the name uh, Christus Masse, which was called Christ's Mass. That's where Christmas came from.
Okay. Okay, enough of that. Okay, so we're here. we have Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. This is what I would refer to as the unholy trinity. This comes from Babylon the Great. How many have heard of Nimrod? Okay, Nimrod is actually mentioned in the Bible. He founded Babylon. He founded, uh, he found, founded four cities. You can see that right before the Tower of Babel. And he was the instigator of building that, ta- that Tower of Babel. Semiramis was his wife. She's the one we've already talked about. This is the word. You can see her, the spelling of her name, Semiramis. That's the name what Thyatira used to be called. It was named after her. And then Tammuz was their child. And we've talked, if you want to go back, we've talked about stuff about this, the connection with Babylon and this what I call the unholy trinity. But it all focuses upon distorting and perverting the truth of the true faith and the true teaching that God had originally given and handed down to Adam and Eve and the corruption you got a question? Yeah, a couple of them. Right? Nimrod. That's a term usually applied to hunters, people that you know, go on a field to shoot deer or whatever. Okay. Is there a connection between... Yes. Nimrod, he, he, was, he had... Um, they used to say he was a hunter against God. Ah. His name literally meant the rebel. Another question. I noticed in the uh, other one, he, he used the reference C-E... Instead of A.D. or B.C.? Yes. Common error? Uh, common error, or could be Christian error. You can take it either way. Yeah, they used to, they used to call it A.D. and B.C. Right. The world doesn't like us saying B.C. Because before Christ. And they say, well, you know, what's Christ? If you're not a Christian, who's Christ? Why, why do you mention Christ? And A.D. meant after the birth of Christ, right? After the year. It actually, some people think A.D. means after the death of Christ, but that's not true. It's after the year of our Lord. In other words, after the birth of Christ. It was Italian, right? Or not Italian. <laughs> Close. Latin, right? <laughs> So um, so anyway, so this is the beginning of what I call the unholy trinity. And this unholy trinity is in every ancient religion. Yeah. They're just called different names. Now, why are they called different names? Because at the Tower of Babel, the languages were confused. And so people yeah. called them by different names. Before the Tower of Babel, and this is a hard concept. We hear it in Sunday school and maybe we forgot. But the reason people speak different languages, according to the scripture, is that God miraculously, supernaturally confounded the language. Some people say, you know, know they're in the church and they go, well, I don't believe that. Well, you know what? You got a real problem. Is you let the devil rob you on that one small thing. And once you, once you say, out of your mouth. I don't care what the doctrine is. When you come against a scripture and you say, I don't believe that, you just set yourself up to completely wipe out your faith. Some people say, well, you know, I don't believe that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rests. I think evolution took course. As soon as you say that, you are setting yourself up for destruction. I don't understand everything. But we have, you know, how many heard this? For me, one of the most amazing, when I was a child, before I even knew, before I became Christian, one of the most amazing, profound effects upon me was when I watched Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. It was so awesome, and I used to watch it all the time. When the waters parted, how many saw that and said, Wow. What would you get? I mean, just to be there, right? If I could just go back in time and witness it. And you know what? We will be able to because nothing shall be impossible for us. I believe we will be able to see that. You know, just like we, today, we go and we, we rewind it. Well, we don't even rewind a video now. We put a CD in, right? Or a DVD in. But we'll be able to see it just the way it was. Isn't that going to be cool? 
Now, there's people out there that say, well, you know, uh, God didn't really part the waters. That they, uh, the, the water was so low that they were able to cross because it hadn't rained for a long time. Now, this is pur- purely speculation, right? By the theologians, the professors. And they say, all, all these people cross because of the water was low, like about an inch of water. Well, how did all the Egyptian soldiers d- drown? And you see, you can follow. Anytime you get someone who's a skeptic and starts trying to rationalize, they box themselves in a corner. Yeah. I've read uh, articles that were substantiated that some of the chariot wheels are still there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's actually a bridge underneath that water that God formed. Don't ask me how, but I mean, there's, there's, you can get a DVD on it where um, archaeologists have discovered this. There's actually a bridge underneath that water because it's, the Bible says they literally cross on dry ground. That means something had to be higher than the water when it, when it parted. Well, anybody that can pile up water and stack that surely make up for it. That, that's our God, right? But you don't have to doubt anything. But as soon as you doubt, you're ready for a fall. This is the same one that came. Satan always does the same trick. Remember the Garden of Eden? He's always got the same play plan. Or, you know, it's like a, you know, when you when you have a, a, a coach, right? And he's always got the, the the play. He's got a little book of plays. And Satan only has a couple plays. And he uses them, and he has them fall all the time. So he opens up the book, and here's one of his master schemes. He says, hath God said... Who did he say that to? Eve. Eve. Hath God said... And she started adding to his word and trying to rationalize to herself. She didn't have to do that. All she had to say was, yeah, that's what God said. And that's the first attack he's going to make against you. Did God really say that? Are you going to tell me you really believe what's in that Bible? Here's a hard one to believe. Joshua looked up at the sun, commanded it to stand still. And it did. Scientists will say, oh, that couldn't have happened. God will never, never let you down. If you trust in God's word, you'll find, you may not have the answer, but if you believe God's word, you're always right. You're always, now let's, let's go to the next step because... See, this was, these guys were known as Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Now, here we are in Egypt. Whoa. These are the same, this is the same unholy trinity. It was in Egypt. We have Isis, Horus, and Seb. And you see the names under it. Isis was just a name of Semiramis. Huh. Tammuz was named Horus in Egypt, and Nimrod was named Seb. This is, once again, the unholy trinity. What's interesting here about Egypt, if you go back and you look... In fact, I preached it one time in the church here. Uh, unfortunately, it's not recorded. But um, if, you, if you look at the book of Exodus this way, when Moses came against Pharaoh, and there were them ten plagues, every one of those plagues was against an individual god where God showed that he had power over all the gods of Egypt. And he just wiped them out. And then, of course, the last one was the angel of death, right? But so there's your your, uh, unholy trinity again, Isis, Horus, and Seb. This becomes important. I-H-S. You may have seen that. Acronym, and that's why we and that's why we bring this up because Jezebel is listed in Thyatira, and the spirit behind her is the same one that was in this Isis, the same one that's in Semiramis. And look at here, uh, Semiramis and Tammuz came from Babylon, but look at this; they had the same they had the same God and and uh, and child in China. They had the same one in India. They were just named different. In Ephesus, you'll see it. In Egypt, you see it. 
In Israel, they had, you read it in the Bible, Ashtoreth and ba um, Baal, uh, or some people say Baal. Uh, and then in Rome, you had Venus and Cupid. In Greece, you had the same thing. So this is the same, what, what I want you to say, there were many different names of gods, but it's the same spirit energizing behind the whole thing. Is Jezebel's spirit always represented as a, in a female? No. Is Jezebel always Jezebel's a female? Jezebel, no, Jeze Jezebel can manifest in male or female. Right. Like, oh, those were female. <laughs> well, those are, those, re because, because the Isis or Semiramis spirit, she, she was represented as a queen of heaven. And in every one of those places, in every one of those places, they were manifested. There was a goddess or queen of heaven that was a virgin who and gave birth to a child. Okay? Yes? In spirit, there's really no gender. There's no That's male right. or female. That's right. They can take on whatever form. And in fact, you can have many, many demons. You don't, it just doesn't have to be one. Um, in fact, I, we probably won't get into it today, but we're gonna look, we would even look at some of the aspects of the Jezebel spirit. But it's very alive and well. Well, the reason I ask is because all through this time that I've been traveling with you among the Pentecostals, whenever a woman would rise up and take control of the congregation and uh, shame the men, it was called the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel, yeah. But it, when you when you when you get into the study of of Jezebel into all the detail, you can see that she can work in in men as well. She chooses women more. I don't know why. I think I think it all stems all the way from Adam and Eve, really. You see this relief. This is a relief of Nimrod. Okay? We talked about Nimrod. Now, there's something interesting, I, I, an interesting parallel I want to bring out. And, you know, as, we, as we're going to th through Thyatira, the weird thing is, I'm, I'm like... I'm bouncing back and forth back then and now, but we're going to go from the very present and then cover some things and show you the relevance before we go back and see it rise up. Because if I spend time, this is what the Spirit is saying to me, if I spend time going through some of the stuff, you won't see the connection. It takes too long to see the connection. But if I show you the significance, which we're going to see just in a minute here, as, as we go to the next slide, we're going to see something that's really significant. And you're going to see why we are, why this is important to go through the stuff that we are. Anybody know who the one on the right is? That's the current one. That's not the current pope, that's right. It's, uh, in fact, uh, you got to go back to popes. That was John Paul. But now, I, 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 you, you see these two pictures? Doesn't look like much in common there, does it? Is that weird? Oh, if, if that wows you, you're in, a, you're in for a treat because you're going to see a lot more wowing. Okay? But that is interesting, isn't it? Um, other than what we just pointed out, you would just say, hey, you're kind of wearing the same hat, right? <laughs> And that hat is actually pretty important. We talked about this before. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, the hat comes from the worship of Dagon. Remember in the Philippines used to worship Dagon? Remember that? Well, Dagon was the main god of the Philippines. Uh, the, Phil the Philippines is uh, actually, uh, uh, the word is pronounced in Israel, uh, Palestinians. Oh. So that's how you pronounce it. So they're still with us, by the way. And they're still causing all the havoc that they caused in the times of the judges. But do you see, do you see the cap? on this, the, uh, the one on the right here, he's the high priest of Dagon. That's the way he dressed. And like a fish. Okay, and on the, on the left side, you, you see their hats? Uh -huh. There's a common link between Dagon. A hat represents a fish. It's a mouth. It's a it's a mouth. It's a fish's head with a mouth, and this is the now. The next slide is something I don't ever want to see. Can we go to the next slide? I hope this never happens. 
in this church. If this happens, and now because this is on YouTube, I have disguised every one of these people, so we know who they are. The rest of the world does not know, okay? And if you're one of them, just keep silent. Nobody will know who you are. So just don't let anybody know who you are. But if I come to church one day and I see this, I'm not coming to church next week. <laughs> okay? But the funny thing is, well, they got the Groucho Marx. Did you notice they got the Groucho Marx glasses on? And they're pretty cute. You know, that's what you can do with Photoshop. Okay? Now I know what I look like being cat. <laughs> so that goes beyond cat. Maybe Babylonian. Yeah. Okay? But I, I wanted to see. Remember we talked about the Nickelodeons? It's kind of where this stuff came from. But, uh, <laughs> but this is not really what I want for my leadership. Now, Brother George may feel differently. See this, uh, the, the visa kind of, when you say visa, when you see the visa credit card, you, you think about econ economics, right? Yeah. And when we, a lot of times when we talk about the future and the control, the Antichrist, would have, it says you, no man would be able to buy or sell without the mark. This whole thing about the visa, in order to accomplish this and con the control... This type of thing had to come. In the Western world, if the Antichrist is going to control all of economics, he needs computers to do so. Okay? And it's very interesting. Do you see that the word visa? Remember we had MasterCard and Visa and some of the other ones? They had, you know, everybody had their own. But they, I don't even remember all of the cards. But Visa was the winner. Mm -hmm. It, it started out as Bank of America. J.C. Penn is the very first. Anyway, v well, Visa didn't used to be called Visa. It's called Bank of America or MasterCard. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that Visa won because Visa, as you can see, in three different languages, Rome, the Roman numeral 5I or 5-1 was 6. In Greece, the S was a 6. And in uh, uh, Babylon, the Sanskrit, the A was a six. You have visa six six six, and it does have play a. It's a piece of the the puzzle. When it says the Antichrist will control the economics of the world, this is relevant. But I wanted to bring that out. Just throw, we're not going to talk about this anymore right now. I just want to throw it out there for, for, for you know, so, because I know how, how much you're, you love this idea of economics. And we talked about how Saturn, the name, came up to 666. And I wanted to show you, well, how does that work? And there's this thing called G, Gematria. Sometimes you'll hear me say Gematria. Gematria is a system. It's, it, it, it works. It's, it's been used n not only since the time of the, the um, recordings of the book of uh, Revelation when John wrote it. It goes back to all of these ancient religions. A lot of the, uh, many, many of these gods used to be identified with numbers. It just so happens that Saturn was identified with 666. And when John wrote his book, and said 666, it was not a mystery. Well, it, it was a mystery to some, but it, it's, not, it, it, it's not an accident. Because he was referring to Saturn being the main god of Rome, which used to be called Saturnia. He had the seven horns on his head, just like, or the, just like Satan. Gematria, the the, uh, the method came showed us that it came up with six six six. Just going to read this, uh, so so you have some background of of what where do we get this from? So gematria, the the Greek meaning is geometry. How many took geometry? 
in school. Geometry is a bunch of rules, right? Theories. It works. It's mathematics. Uh, well, Gematria assigns numerical value to a word or phrase in the, the belief that words or phrases with identical numerical values bear some relationship to each other or bear some relation to the number itself as it may apply to nature, a person's age, the calendar year, or the like. The primary language for Gematria calculations has always been and remains Hebrew and to a lesser degree Aramaic. Does anybody know what Aramaic is? Aramaic actually was a... Go ahead. I was going to say the symbols. Okay. Aramaic is a language that... Remember when Israel went into Babylonian captivity? When they went into Babylonian captivity, they spoke Hebrew. After 70 years when they came out, they spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was a, a kind of a very close association with Hebrew... And some of the Old Testament was actually written in Aramaic. And you can see in the book of Daniel, for instance, the book of Daniel has several several large pieces that are written in Aramaic. God seems to have taken Hebrew and Aramaic and wed them together in the scripture. We didn't do it. God did it. It's in the Old Testament. We don't know why he chose to do that. The other thing he did was he took the um, script of the Aramaic, and that is the script uh, that you see today. You see where we have the Hebrew letters? Those Hebrew letters are actually, we, we call them Hebrew letters. That's actually Aramaic script. Before they went into the captivity, the script of Hebrew was different than it is today. We are using the Aramaic script, which is okay, because there is so much similarity to the two languages, but God seems to have joined them together. You know what the scriptures say? Remember Adam and Eve, what God has joined together, we can't split it up ourselves, right? God did it. Let's just accept it, and uh, we'll move on from there. But the primary language has always been Hebrew and to a lesser degree Aramaic. I think the reason is because there's not that much Aramaic in the Bible, but there are significant portions that are in Aramaic. So, uh, just so you know, most of it's Hebrew. Here's the Hebrew alphabet, and the Hebrew alphabet, the letters are all assigned a number. Okay, so this is the way it works. If you have now, you, if you have this, and you'll have the slide in your notes, and you, you will be able to take any Hebrew word now and figure out what the geometria is and add that up. So, if you want to spend the rest of your life thinking who might be the Antichrist, and you know what it is in Hebrew, you could spend. I would not. I would not recommend you do that because it would be very boring, and you probably won't figure it out anyway. Yes. They looked like Chinese. Ancient, uh, oh. You know, symbols that they used. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's true. That, and that, but that is the Hebrew. If you if you go to Israel today, or if you look at the if you look on the internet, if you see uh, Israel uh, site that's written in Hebrew, that's the characters that they use today. Uh, the script. If you look at an Israeli uh, newspaper, if you go to Israel and the street signs, it's you know it's it, it the names are in. Um, the Hebrew there. Here's the Greek letters. They also have, you know, values because that's the way they didn't have a number system like we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we had letters. They use their letters for numbers. Okay, so every word can be transferred over to a numeric because that's the way it works. And you learn this in Roman numerals. How many in school? learned the Roman numeral system. Okay, Then they don't teach it anymore, and it's sad about that. But I put a little thing up in the right-hand corner here because it's important. You see that up there, 666? You're going to see this again. Okay, that is, if you look down at the sixth value, it's called a stigma, and it's the sixth, the value is six, okay? We're going to see that again. Notice the letter. It kind, what does it kind of look like? Huh? An S. Okay. Or a snake. Or a snake. In fact, this is the number 
of Isis. Remember we said the number of Saturn was those four letters and they came up to 666? The secret number that Isis was worshipped under was these three values and it was pronounced well that's kind of weird and I'm going to show you when we come to it but I'm going to give you a heads up on that how many have seen pictures of the statues of Isis from Egypt or maybe from when in Rome and because they worship you know they worship Isis throughout and we're not talking about the Isis in Arabia or in uh, Iraq we're not talking about those soldiers we're talking about the, the goddess Isis she had a snake coming out of her forehead. Remember the mark is on the forehead? And her mark was a snake coming literally out just in that same shape. And they pronounce it S-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-
So what he was saying was John first was giving a revelation that it would be this false prophet or this antichrist would be like Christ, Christos, but the spirit inside of Christ was that of the serpent. Remember Jesus said, many shall come in my name. Many false prophets would come, but it's the spirit, okay? And in the next slide you can see, I've separated this so you can get a good picture at what we're looking at. When, when John said 666, this is what he was looking at. And here you can see how it adds up to 666. Okay, and you can go back and you can refer to these slides. We don't have to spend a lot of time here. We uh, talked about um, how at the same time the papacy was rising up and the Pope would begin taking control and the Catholic Church would emerge. At the same time, this other person, Nij, and this other religion was rising up. Same time, Muhammad. You see what he's got in his hand there, the Koran. Okay? This comes, uh, this is important, it comes into play. Now, according to the Koran, this is, you know, it's broken up like chapters, just like, uh, less like your Bible is. In 48.29, it literally says this, the mark of them is on their foreheads from the traces of prostration. Now, this mark we haven't seen actually on a Muslim's head, but it is believed by many that there's coming a time where literally the Muslims will have an engraving put in their head because they will want to be identified who's, who's with Allah or who's with Muhammad and who is not. Okay? But this sign that's on his head right now, that is an insignia or a symbol that represents Muhammad. Muhammad is pronounced in Greek, Mohammed. And this... People have known this for, I don't know, 1,800 years. They figured this out, or not that long, uh, when, when Muhammad rose up, which uh, about from, from 600 A.D. or 650 A.D. Um, onward, they began to figure out Muhammad has a numerical value of 666. Well, that's kind of significant also since we can trace the rising of Islam in Muhammad from the prophet Daniel. So it is interesting that if he's supposed to represent Antichrist, that his name is, it has the equivalent of 666. Now here comes something that's uh, kind of a, a key point about Islam. The next slide here. Up above, we have the what looks like the XES, which we said was how John wrote 666 in the book of Revelation. Down below, we have Arabic. And you can see something very similar there. And what that says in Arabic is, In the name of Allah, with cross sword symbol of Islam, and it's read right to left, but you see the cro the, it, it, the, that cross swords appears a lot of times right next to this, which this word or this uh, letter or these letters that look like or that are, uh, mean in the name of Allah. And it looks like that middle letter has just fallen on its side. That's the same letter that Bullinger said represented the serpent. This is... Um, uh, actually, a, uh, a flag of, uh, of the kingdom, uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia, or a, uh, the seal, the seal of Saudi Arabia. You can see those, the, uh, the knives there. This is the actual flag. And I've, I've, went to, I've put um, color there so you can see the letters there that we, that we were looking at before. This mark is everywhere throughout Islam. Look at that. If John was trying to say the mark of Antichrist will look like this, and you look at the one, it does, the mark does look very much like what John said. Remember, he said there's a name, the number, and the mark. 
The Quran itself speaks of how true Muslims will have the mark of Muhammad on their foreheads as a sign that they worship. And here's a quote from the Quran. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those with him are hard against the, the disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Thou, O Muhammad, seest them bowing and failing, uh, falling prostrate in worship, seeking bounty from Allah and his acceptance. Their, the mark of them is on their foreheads from the traces of prostration. Oh, here. Islam, Islamic jihadist movement set to take over Israel is a highly religious movement seeking to strictly obey the Quran. They are highly conscious of these verses. They perceive those who don't have their mark in the forehead as having the mark in the forehead of condemnation. And that comes from Surah 935, which is basically chapter 9. Verse 35, the idea of a seal being placed upon non-Muslims who refuse to convert to Islam is found also in the Quran, in chapter 7, 101, where it says, Thus doth Allah print upon the hearts and minds and foreheads of disbelievers. Now, again, the guy's hand there, the mark on that hand is just somebody's idea that he, he feels that this will eventually happen when Islam takes uh, for more control. But what is, what, what, what is done today, most of these Muslim soldiers are wearing, you see the ring there? The ring they wear on their right hand, and it is a mark on their right hand. And they also have a mark on, on the head. It's not engraved. But we'll see that in a a minute. Um, I'm going to read this out of the Quran. Thus does Allah seal over the hearts of the disbelievers, and we did not find for most of them any covenant, but indeed we found most of them defiantly disobedient. What that means in Islam talk is if you fall into that category, they have a right to kill and cut off the head of the infidel. In the name of God or in the name of Allah. They feel completely justified. Now here's something you may be familiar with. Have you seen these headbands that they wear? Well, this mark that we've been talking about is always on their headbands. So they they already have a mark of Allah on their right hand. They always have a mark of Allah on their forehead. Because they have the headband and the ring. This, and and here, here's something interesting. The seal of Muhammad was held to have magic qualities, and the loss of the seal amounted to the loss of the caliphate and the loss of unity among Muslims. Caliphate means the Muslim empire, which is what ISIS is trying to establish right now in our day. The, uh, now, the ISIS group there, or, or uh, what uh, Barack Obama calls ISIL, uh, are popularizing the seal again, announcing a caliphate and urging Muslim unity, a unity which will ultimately be focused against Israel. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the reason ISIS has been so successful, they are using all kinds of multimedia, commanding anyone who's a follower of Muhammad to come and claim the promised land given to Abraham. It's time to rise up. Allah is calling all the faithful. That's why people are leaving the United States and going on. You think, how can people born in this country go over there and join forces with them to eliminate Israel and, and to cut off the heads of people over there? How can they, how can they feel called to do this? Because they are saying that if you're a Muslim, then you need to join with us because now is the time of the end. Now is the time of the restoration of the caliphate, the Muslim empire. They're very serious about this. Another thing going on, and you can see the mark that, um, uh, that shows that it has to do with the, uh, the book of Revelation in 666. Now here you see the Islamic State announced that they're going to have their own coinage, and they proposed coinage would the proposed coinage would indeed have the seal of Muhammad on it, 
Uh, there is no, what it says there on those coins is there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. It's in the middle of the coins and around it, it says, surely this is the fraternity of your faith, a single faith. I am your Lord, so worship me. And it comes right out of um, the Quran, which is uh, the chapter 21, verse 92. On other coins at the bottom, it says, then there will be a caliphate on the model of the prophet, quoting a supposed prophecy of Muhammad that the world will be ruled by a Muslim state at the end of times. It shows you why things are happening as they are. And every time you see this, this is uh, what is on the, uh, the ISIS, ISIS flag. There, you see the letters in green there? That's the same thing we've been looking at. It's the same mark that John talked about, except the middle letter is flipped on its side. And this is the same thing you see on their forehead. You see the mark? You see how they got the mark of Antichrist or the, the, of Muhammad on their forehead? Remember we talked about Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. It's very interesting that Tammuz, the faithful followers of Tammuz, used to wear the headband with his mark. That's where it came from. That mark represented the first letter of his name, Tammuz. And all the followers of Tammuz wore that mark. Know that there seems to be a connection here. And I want, to sh- I want to show you what the Catholic Church did. Let's- How many have heard of the church fathers? Okay, when, it sound- when you talk about the ch- early church fathers, it sounds like, oh, well, these guys really knew what they were talking about, right? Because we're going back. No, when you hear early church fathers, it's the early Catholic church fathers. Okay, so uh, you can be really misled by somebody saying, well, according to the church fathers... They were the Catholic Church fathers. Okay? So according to the early church Catholic fathers, they attested to the use of the sign of the cross and that it is the seal or mark of Christianity, the the mark that opposes the Shema. I'm going to show you what the Shema is in a minute. It's a Jewish term. The the emphasis of the cross being... Uh, a mark of Christianity actually arises out of Christianity. The uh, the word cross in the Bible is not really there. In the New Testament, how many have read in the New Testament cross? The cross of Christ, the cross, this, the cross, that. There is no word cross in your Bible. It says it in English, but... In Greek, it's an upright stake. It's a staros. And Jesus was fastened to the upright stake, and that's how he died. He was crucified, and he rose from the dead. That's a fact. But the idea of a cross really was perpetrated by Catholicism. Now, let me show you the quotes here, how this happened. Tertullian described the commonness of the sign of the cross this way. He said, in all our travels and movements, in all our coming and going, in putting on our shoes at the bath, at the table, in lighting our candles, in lying down, in sitting down, whatever employment occupies us, we mark our foreheads with the sign of the cross. How many have seen this? It's very common. You see that all the time, right? How many have seen them where they actually put a mark on the forehead of their per- the parishioners or the members of their church? This, this did not come from Christianity. Sometimes it's an X. So, yeah, exactly. Um, this actually came out of Rome from the, the worship of the sun god where they used to mark the faithful with a cross in their forehead. And what the Bible tells you is don't get a mark on your forehead. What's the the mystery, what's happening here is the Antichrist, people are going to miss what's happening because some of them are going to say, well, I think it's Islam. So I'm not going to get the mark of Mohammed. 
on my forehead. But at the same time, the Pope's rising up in power. And he's going to want to distinguish all the faithful Christians to get a permanent cross on their head. I want you to understand where the cross came from. That puts, now that doesn't mean you have to get rid of your crosses and you, you got to take them off the wall. That, that's not what we're taught. We're talking about having an engraving of a cross in your forehead. 